Hello, my name is Dmitry Polyakovsky, and I'm excited to be presenting at this virtual conference. In the past, when I presented at Redis Conf, I had to fly down there to San Francisco. But now I can do this talk directly from my home in Seattle. This presentation is based on the talk I did at the Seattle Redis Conf event just a few months ago, before the coronavirus pandemic broke out. And that talk was based on using Redis to mine GitHub public APIs. I used Redis as a job queue and as a database to temporarily store data before I did additional aggregations. And then coronavirus pandemic broke out and I was sitting at home trying to make sense of all this data. And I admit it was depressing to see the ever increasing death toll to see how many people have been infected around the world. What I wanted was a tool to help me analyze this data for specific locations, for example, King County, Washington, where Seattle is located, and also to see data for specific days. I wanted to know how many new people got sick yesterday or passed away last week. I couldn't find such a tool, so I built one myself. I'm a senior software developer at Oracle Cloud. You can read my blog, follow me on Twitter, or check out the code that I used as part of this presentation. The way I think about Redis is it's a multi-purpose tool, like a Swiss Army knife. It's good at a wide variety of things, and I used it for different purposes. I use it as a cache, as a job queue, to throttle access to my APIs, to use store user session information, and so on. In this presentation, I will focus on using Redis for distributed lock management, using Redis as a job queue, and using Redis as a database to actually store data. The overall architecture of my application is I created multiple containers. There is a, contain there is a set of containers that run schedulers, and Redlock with Redis ensures that only single scheduler can execute it at any given time. That's the distributed lock management part. Separately, I have workers in different containers reading from Redis as a queue. And last, I have web servers that serve data that simply read data from Redis database. You may ask, why such complexity? It's a pretty simple application, and you're absolutely right. I could have written a simple script and run it via CronTab in a single container or a virtual machine. But I wanted to show how Redis can be used to really scale things. For example, if I need more workers, I can launch multiple containers. If I need more web servers or web containers, I can increase that capacity as well. And this presentation is also based on the work I did on real life systems where we were dealing with far larger volumes of data. We had multiple job queues with different priorities. We were running many feeds per day, processing vast quantities of data, and we had to scale up and down as our demand changed. Let's review our dev environment. I'm using Docker and Docker Compose. Docker Compose allows me to start and stop separate containers at the same time. For example, here I have a Docker file referenced, and I expose port 5000. That is my web container. To build this application, I used Python Flask framework, which runs on port 5000 by default. Then I specify environment variable container type web and use some and read some common environment var variables from a file. That's not important here. Then I have a container called worker, where I specify container type worker. I deploy the same code there, but I don't expose any ports. And then I have a scheduler which says environment variable container type scheduler. Last but not least, I'm running Redis latest version 601. This Docker file drives this, this Docker Compose file drives this Docker file. It's a pretty simple file. I start with a Python 3.6 base. I create a few environment variables. I copy my code, install the dependencies, and specify my entry point. Entry point in a Docker file is what starts when the container starts. And in a real system, you probably want to use something like run it or system D and create it, make it into a daemon. But for simplicity's sake, I stuck with a bash script here. This is where the business logic resides that controls which process runs in which container. I use the container type environment variable web. If, if the container type variable is web, I start either web, Flask web server or G Unicorn web server, depending on whether I'm running dev locally or in production. Then if I'm running a container type worker, I start worker using the RQ worker library. RQ is a Python library that helps me integrate with Redis as a job queue. And this RQ worker 
will watch a Redis list that will be used as a job queue and grab jobs from there as necessary. And last is I'm running a Flask. Uh, I'm running my own scheduler using a Flask CLI, specifying the scheduler container type. First, let's talk about distributed lock, ma distributed lock management. Why do we even need distributed lock management? Why not use something simple as CronTab? And you're absolutely right. CronTab is a great tool. I've used it on many projects, but it does have some limitations. For example, it can be a single point of failure that if our process, CronTab process, or the server running CronTab crashes, nothing will be executed. And separately, it can be a scalability issue. As we're running more and more jobs, we can reach the limits of what a single server can do. There are ways to solve the scalability. For example, we can separate the job scheduling from job execution. So the CronTab scheduler will simply put the job in a queue. And then multiple workers running on different servers can grab their jobs from queue and execute them in parallel. But it doesn't solve the single point of failure. And if our jobs are item potent, let's say generating reports, we could just run two schedulers and do everything twice. But some tasks are more important than that. For example, if we are running a billing process charging users monthly subscription fee for access, we don't want to run those jobs twice, or we'll have lots of unhappy users. And we also don't want to run those jobs, not at all, because otherwise we'll have lots of unhappy business executives. This is where distributed lock management comes in. It allows us to run a particular process on any server, which gives us redundancy, but it ensures that the process runs only on one server. And that's the red lock property number one, mutual exclusion. At any given time, only one process can run. Second important issue is we want to avoid deadlock. For example, if one process starts, acquires a lock on a shared resource, and then crashes before it can properly release the lock, none of the other processes will run until we manually intervene and clean things up. Redis solves it with TTL. And third, we want to ensure that there's a certain fault tolerance. We don't want our red, our red locking mechanism to become a single point of failure in itself. For example, in the past, I sometimes used simple file-based locking. I would create a volume, mount it to two different servers, and when my process starts, it will acquire a lock on a file on that shared volume. It works, but the downside is that if for whatever reason my server loses access to that volume mount, it cannot acquire a lock, it cannot run. Or if the volume mount goes away completely, then none of my servers will be able to acquire a lock. So the way Redis and Redlock algorithm solves this problem is by creating a locking mechanism where the process has to acquire a lock on the majority of Redis nodes. So if one of them is having issues, hopefully other Redis servers are still up and running. So you can read more about Redlock on the Redis.io website. In Redis, the Redlock algorithm data, Redlock data looks very simple. It's just a string. You will specify a key. In my case, I called it import data. And I when the code creates a lock, it also creates a unique key that it will be used later to unlock that key, meaning remove it, the Redis key. Let's look at the code. Here's my scheduler code, which is driven by that Flask CLI process I briefly mentioned before. Let me increase the size. And um, it is also, I'm using here a Python library called AP Scheduler. It's not important for the purposes of this presentation, but you're welcome to look up the details on the internet. What I do is I create a DLM object here using a Python Redlock library. It was recommended by Salvatore on their Redlock page on Redis.io website. I acquire, I create a connection to Redis server specifying port and a database. You will notice that even though I have one connection specified, this variable is an array. So I could have specified multiple Redis servers there. That is meant to solve the problem number three, where we don't want our red lock locking mechanism to become a single point, point of failure. I also specify retry count and a delay. This way, if for whatever reason my process can't acquire the lock the first time, it will try again up to three times. And then I have this method called import data. That is the scheduling logic. I try to acquire a lock here specifying the key and the TTL in milliseconds. Then if I'm successfully successful in acquiring the lock, I proceed with the job execution. 
And all I'm doing here is queuing the job. This queue method comes from that RQ library that I mentioned before, and this pushes the data into a Redis list instead of writing it real time. And then I added a time.sleep. The reason I did it is because I want to make sure that the time it takes to execute this chunk of code is longer than a maximum retry. Otherwise, what will happen is that the first scheduler will acquire a lock, do this extremely rapid quickly because queuing a job in Redis takes a fraction of a second, and then it will release the lock. But there's a second scheduler running in parallel, and what it'll do is it'll try to acquire the lock, it'll fail, and it'll retry. But however, the 0.2 seconds is more than enough time to perform this action, queuing the job. So the second scheduler will think that it simply had some kind of a network timeout, it'll acquire a lock, and it'll continue with executing this code fraction of a second after the first scheduler was already finished. So that'll, that'll violate the principle that only one process can run at any given time. So by deliberately slowing down this code, I can guarantee that the second scheduler will try to acquire the lock, will fail, and not continue with any of the scheduling logic. And last, I unlock my resource, which simply removes the Redis key from the Redis database. So you can see here how with a few lines of code, I was able to create a fairly robust scheduling system. Now we're going to talk about using Redis as a job queue. Redis has a number of powerful data structures which help us in this task. The primary one is Redis list. Our producer does an L push, so an item is placed in a Redis list, and a consumer, a worker, does RPUP. Each item is a, usually some kind of a serialized string that contains various job attributes, such as arguments or whichever chunk of code needs to execute. There are a number of libraries in various languages that simplify this. I use the library RQ, as I mentioned, but I could have written the code myself. But in addition to lists, typically a job queue will also need something like sets to store the names of various queues and workers and their assi assignments. Sorted sets can be very useful. The use case there is if our job fails to execute. For example, we try to download a file from a web server and we timed out. What we want to do is we want to retry. But we don't want to retry right away. We want to wait a little bit, let's say a minute. In a sorted set, you can specify a score which in this case is going to be a timestamp. So a library would fail to execute a job, and instead of pushing it back into a list, it can push it into a sorted set. Then a worker has to watch that sorted set and look at the items with the lowest score, meaning items with the nearest timestamp. It should compare the timestamp toward against the current time, and if it's already passed, it should execute the job. So this way we can even implement exponential backoff. So if our job fails the first time, we would try it in a minute, and then we try it in five minutes, and then 15 minutes, and so on. And eventually we can push the job fa fail job into a dead letter queue where we can later look at it manually. All of this logic has to be done in the client library, but Redis data structure help us. And we can also use Redis hashes to store job details after it finished executing and expire them at a certain point in the future. This can be helpful for various manual analysis that we sometimes have to do. And Redis data looks like this. So here I have a data structure called RQ, queues. It's a sorted set. And I only store one queue there called default. In the real life systems that I worked on, I used, usually had multiple queues. I would have high priority, default, low. I'm, sometimes I had separate queues dedicated to sending out emails and so on. Then. Redis will store the workers that are <coughs> currently monitoring this uh, Redis instance, and then it'll store the mapping of queues to workers. All of this logic is taken care of me by the library. And here is an example of what a Redis hash will look like with the details of a job that just executed. And in my application here, I'm using Python pandas to help me with data acquisition and data manipulation. So frequently in a Python pandas code, we'll have something like read CSV, and we just read CSV file, and we, it converts into a data frame. We can also read JSON or read data directly from a database. Later, we can aggregate the data and do, similar, and do queries similar to SQL select and group by type aggregations. Let's look at code. 
So here's our jobs module. It was queued by the scheduler, and this is the job. This is what it gets executed on the scheduler server. And I'm sorry, not on scheduler, on the worker server. But it gets queued from the scheduler. We simply hit a URL, go into GitHub. The data I'm using is provided by Johns Hopkins, and it's in CSV format, and it looks kind of like this. So we can see that we have locations, states, I'm sorry, counties, states, country, timestamps, lat long, and the metrics that I care about is confirmed and death, because I wanted to look at how many new cases there were and how many people passed away in a specific location. So this is the CSV data I'm importing. It gets downloaded here with this command called read CSV. It's a panda data frame. And then I'm going to iterate through this data frame. I'm doing a little bit of manipulation here of data, only filtering out only United States data because I have nice data set with county states. And this is the line where I save data to Redis as a database. I will talk more about this model in the next part of this presentation. But as you can see, this code is pretty straightforward. Simply download a CSV, process it, and save each record into a Redis hash. Now we come to the part where we're using Redis as a database. And I admit, this was a little challenging. At first, I started using Redis as hashes, Redis hashes for my data structures. Because what I was doing, I was taking the CSV, converting it into hash, for you know, county, state, country, date, and so on, and storing it in Redis using hmset and extracting it using hgetall. But it became a little difficult to maintain the kind of relationships that I needed to maintain to have between location and a particular data metric like confirmed cases or deaths. So I found a library called Walrus. It's a Python library that creates some very nice abstraction, and it helps me create this model. I called it location. And I define certain attributes, such as name, county, country, state, and also confirmed and death. You can see that those are hash fields. So what the library will do behind the scenes is that it will create at least three hashes here. One for the primary location, where it will store name, county, state, and country. An additional hash for the confirmed, with a basic relationship to the location. And additional hash for the death, also with a relationship to the location. In Redis, data will look like this. So this is the location, King County, Washington. It's got name, county, state, and so on. This is a, sort of, this is a set that will be used as an index to look up this name, to look up this location ID by this name. This is the hash that stores the number of confirmed cases for a specific location ID. And this is the hash that stores that confirmed the number of deaths for a specific location ID. We can see the data in Redis. These are just Redis keys. And there's quite a few of them. So let's look at the model in our code. So here's the code that we saw in the slide. But then comes the challenging part, is that we have to extract the data and do some manipulation and formatting of it. So I created this mo module called formatters, where what I'm doing here is essentially I'm querying Redis for different keys, and then taking Redis hashes, converting them into Panda data series in this code right here, and then turning those data series into Panda data frames, and later I'm doing aggregations on that essential equivalent of SQL group by queries. This was a little tricky. I seriously missed basic SQL group by type functionality. Okay. And now comes a bonus section. We can also use Redis as a cache. Remember how I said that each of those data points is stored in a separate Redis hash and then I extract them and do various manipulations on it? Well, this requires lots and lots of round trips between my application and Redis. And even though Redis is very fast, doing hundreds of thousands of requests can become slow. But I can just cache the data after it's been generated, aggregated, and stored in a separate Redis database just as a cache. And then all I need is one trip to get the cache data. So a small bonus section. In Redis, the cache data is very simple. It is just a string. 
with a unique key. Now you'll notice that I'm using Redis for multiple purposes, but I am using different Redis databases for different purposes. For example, I'm using Redis database zero as a cache, database one for my queue to store those data structures. Redis database two is used for distributed log management and database three is used for storing data. You don't have to do this, but I prefer to separate my different data sets that way. This way, if I have to flash cache, I can safely do a flash DB on database zero where my cache is stored. Let's look at the website. So here's my dashboard. This is for King County, Washington. You can see the cases have confirmed cases, a number of deaths. And this is the data I was looking for last about a month ago when I wanted to make sense of all this information. This requires at least three round trips to Redis to extract data for cases, death, and for location. But here is the data for Washington State. And you can see that I have multiple counties. So to aggregate this data, I had to query all the counties in Washington State, extract all of their cases of confirmed and all the deaths that occurred in Washington State, and then summarize it. So this is where caching does help. Let's summarize our presentation and talk about the pros and cons. We're able to use Redis for multiple purposes, which is great. If we needed a separate technology for a job queue, we could have used RabbitMQ, or we could have used MySQL as a database, or we could have used Memcache for caching. The downside is that it would have complicated our infrastructure. We're also able to use Redis flexible data structures to store different kinds of data. For example, in our models, if we wanted to add more attributes here, it's just one, lines of one line of code. If we wanted to add a new model, we could have just changed this one file. There was no need for alter, SQL, alter table SQL scripts or migrations. And also the speed is very important. As you saw, I'm queuing jobs here and, and it's very fast. The downside is RAM. Not only am I storing data in Redis in RAM, but separately I'm extracting it from Redis, storing it in my application process and doing all those aggregations there. And the downside of Redis is we cannot query by value. So I had to do quite a bit of work in my application side and use additional libraries. The alternative approaches, we could have used a SQL database or a NoSQL database, RabbitMQ, Memcache, or large flat files. But Redis was able to solve all those problems for us. Here are some useful links to some of the libraries that I used and to the code I used in this presentation. I hope you enjoyed it and found learned something useful. Thank you very much.